All right, welcome back. In this quick lesson, I'm gonna show you uh, the translation log and sort of explain to you how to fill it out effectively to get the maximum points because we know points are important. All right, so what's the translation log? This log is available on Blackboard, this document. It'll be attached to each assignment that has a translation. So translation one, translation two, there will always be a translation log, log link. You can download the document and start a fresh one. Talk a little bit about what it is, how to fill it out. The idea behind the translation log that you see on the screen here is sort of to walk you through the different steps in the five-part model of translation that we're focusing on in this class to have you think a little bit, kind of slow down, and think a little bit about the different steps of the translation as you do them. So say you've download, lo, downloaded a text, something like this. I think this might be a text that we've seen in class. And that is your assignment. You're going to turn the translation of this source text, you're going to go from Spanish to English in this case, in as an assignment for points. As you do this assignment, I want you to also complete the translation log. Notice that on the translation log, there are different sections, right? And this one says uh, section one, interpretation and analysis. So the first two steps in the translation process. And it says very clearly, before you begin translating, read the source text carefully and answer the following questions about the contextual and textual aspects that influence its meaning. So first step is, of course, read the source text carefully and then come back to this table here and you're going to start filling in. And this is really the analysis step, right? So you're going to answer some of these orienting questions. If you remember the previous video, what genre or text variety does the source text exemplify? Hmm, what genre is this? So you might say, oh, okay, this is a, you know, a corporate, and excuse my typing, I'm not going to be very careful, a corporate brochure or an informational brochure about a company. Again, it's not, it's not important to be super technical, right? There's not necessarily a right answer, but I want you to think about what kind of text is this? What's the communicative purpose of the text? Okay, hmm, what would this text be used for, right? So you might say something, provide um, information about the history of this particular, what is it? Um, Juan Valdez brand coffee, right? So provide info about Juan Valdez, right? Valdez coffee. You do not need to write a book here. You don't need to write full paragraph length or even sentence length responses in this section. What's the primary language function of the text? Remember, there are three, vocative, informative, and expressive. Well, it's not expressive. In expressive. It may be informational or it may be vocative. If you think the primary purpose of the language here is to provide information, you would say informative. So here there are only three possible answers, and I want to see you use the word informative, expressive, or vocative. Refer to the previous video if you're still a little bit hazy on those. How would you characterize the intended readership? Again, people visiting Colombia, people interested in Colombian coffee, okay? Um, coffee drinkers, something like that, just to get you thinking a little bit about the readership. Is the linguistic register of the source text more informal or more formal? Well, so we look at that, I'm seeing some technical terms, um, but still it's directed toward a general audience of coffee drinkers. I would probably say something like middle of the road formal. I would put that in here, right? You know, more or less formal or not too formal, whatever you think describes the, the register of the text, okay? What's the tone the language used? What's the tone of the language? In other words, what, ad, what attitude does it project about its, its topic? Well, here it's a very kind of like um, respectful, almost reverent because it's retelling the history of Juan Valdez Coffee. So you can use words like that. They're gonna be adjectives that describe the attitude being projected. So you might say something like respectful, right? Or serious. It's certainly not humorous or light or even optimistic, right? Uh, is the source text style fairly generic or distinctive? Again, style is just how does the language used? How is this author, this text combining the different elements of language? It's not especially dense. I would use a word here like um, direct or straightforward, okay? Something like that. It's not particularly dense or complex or peculiar or unique, okay? Um, are sections and segments of the source text purposefully sequenced and carefully connected? So we're looking for connectors like, um, however, I would say that they are. They're certainly sequenced historically 
And there are connectors like desde su nacimiento or in, mi, in el año 2002. So I might say um, yes, right? Um, all right. Is the terminology used in the source text fairly general or more specialized? If we take a close look, we're going to see some fairly specialized. Um, it's a mix, right? There is some specialized terminology. You say, yes, there's a mix of general and specialized terms. That's fair to say. Is the meaning of the source text supposed to be clear or open? It's supposed to be supposed to be clear in this case. So again, these are some orienting questions just to help your brain slow down and make this analysis step a little bit more of a conscious step rather than an unconscious step. The next step uh, section is strategizing. So before you begin translating, consider how the analysis you just conducted will affect your decision making as you work toward an effective translation. Based on your analysis, how important will attaining the following kinds of equivalence be? So you're going to mark, right? You're going to pick is formal equivalence using nearly identical language structures very important based on your analysis. Cognitive equivalence to convey this identical information. That's a no-brainer almost always yes, right? This might be somewhat. If I can do it, I'll try. Dynamic equivalence to ensure an identical reader experience response. Do we want the reader to come away with respect for and understanding and admiration for the Juan Valdez Coffee Company history? I would say somewhat to vary. So these are helping you to strategize and maybe to pick which translation approach, which is this next cluster, right? Based on your analysis, again, of the source text, which overall approach to translation do you think will be most effective? Is it going to be a faithful approach where you use the target language unconventionally to capture some peculiar or characteristic style? No, not in this case. Is it going to be a creative approach using the target language creatively or artistically? No. Or is it going to be a balanced approach based on your analysis to use the target language naturally to convey the same information in the same register and tone? Bingo for this text and many others. Next section, section three, arguably the most important section for me when I'm looking at your translation log. I want it to be filled in um, completely. I want you to document five specific challenges you encountered. A challenge is a specific problem that you had translating the text, something that was difficult. Notice I'm asking two questions here. What is the challenge? So it could be something like, I'm not sure how to translate uh, Federación Nacional de Cafeteros de Colombia. I'm not sure how to translate that acronym, so I put that in. Wasn't sure how to translate, right, Federación Nacional de Cafeteros Colombianos. What makes it challenging? Because it's an acronym, it's a proper noun, right? Why is that challenging? Uh, it includes technical terms. And then, how did you resolve the problem? Oh, I translated it um, directly, right? You, uh, used a calc. So these are when you're thinking about the actual translation procedures. So you're going to document not just the first five, but I really want you to think purposefully about which five challenges really gave you a run for your money. What were the speed bumps as you tried to you trying to cruise through this translation because you're a busy person? What were the real five speed bumps that made you slow down and really think? And then how did you overcome those? Okay. So I want this section to be filled in thoroughly. Okay. Um, number four, evaluating the effectiveness. So you're going to do a self-assessment of your translation. How effective was your translation, right? Looking back and comparing it to the source text. So this has to do with the review step in the process, in the model. Which statement below most closely captures how you would rate your own work on this project? Hopefully your self-assessment matches my assessment as the instructor. Okay. So you can read through those descriptions. And then finally, a reflection stage. Um, I want you to write down, describe two insights or two things that you learned through translating this text. It might be something um, specific about how to resolve a particular type of problem. Oh, I learned that when you're translating the names of associations, you can use a calc and it will be effective or a direct translation. Or it might be something more gen general about the translation process. It might be something about you as a translator. Okay. It could be something about the differences between source and target language or something cultural. But be sure to um, document 
two insights, two things that you learned because every time you do a translation, you're gonna learn something new. So that's the translation log. Do it as you translate. Don't translate the whole document and then come back and backfill the log. I'll be able to tell. Do it as you go, before, during, and after. And it will make you a better translator, plus it's worth points, and points are important.